Good morning. Welcome. If you're new here among us, my name is Gene. I serve here at C3 Church as your lead pastor. And you want to know how to tell if somebody's really your friend? Go to a restaurant with them. And then, like, just, you know, get a salad. Put, like, a piece of the lettuce on your tooth. Right? Just, like, leave it there for a while. If they don't say anything, they're not your friend. <laughs> you ever do that? I'm going to the bathroom, and I'm like, really? So you, like, leave it there. Go back to the table. Nobody, this was your job. Like, this is in the friendship PD, position description. You're supposed to look out for each other, right? So if there's ever something wrong, you see something like toilet paper on my shoe, something like that, look, you got to say something or go to Heather. Right? Trust me, she has absolutely no problem telling me what to do. <laughs> and people love that, too. She comes to Bible study. <laughs> We have a good time. So we've been in the rest of the story. And this is where we're looking to the full counsel of God's Word. All of it. And we've seen that there are some disturbing things. There's a lot of it that people just don't like. But that doesn't mean we don't look at it or we don't listen to it. It has been said that the function of good preaching is to disturb the comfortable, and comfort the disturbed. Which one are you this morning? Maybe a little bit of both, if you're anything like me. Clearly a little disturbed, <laughs> sometimes too comfortable. So let's do a little recap, because we're pretty deep in the series. And if you're new here, you can go back and watch all of them. It's going to take you a little while. But I'll give you like kind of the context, what's been happening here. And so you have the kingdom divided. So think of it like a civil war. So right after King David, right, if you know David and Goliath, King Solomon. And King Solomon, we found out when we read the rest of the story, everybody's like, oh, he was really, really smart and rich. And that's it. That's all you know, right? But we looked at it, and we saw that he broke pretty much every single rule for the king. Every one. That was the rest of the story on him. He really was horrible when you really think about it. He builds a palace for himself that's twice the size of the temple, right? So he's very, very arrogant. It's bad. And so that lands on his son, Rehoboam. And it's only for David's sake, only for your dad's sake, that I'm not going to just take you out right now. But it happens to Rehoboam. And so then Jeroboam, Rehoboam, there you have the split. And you go many generations later, that's where we are. The kingdom of the north falls. That's predicted to Assyria. And now Judah in the south is getting theirs. And so we've moved on from any good kings at all. They're bad. And what you have is the Babylonian king, King Nebuchadnezzar, coming in. And he's installing these client kings. So it's important to remember, like a puppet king. No good king. And so as long as that king pays him tribute, they're good. He's going to leave them alone. And what happens is they eventually rebel and then get taken away. Now, a little fact here that a lot of people don't know. They're supposed to be paying this, even according to God. I want you to think about that. Now, it's in the New Testament, and I've showed you that, and nobody likes that, where you've got to honor your authorities and pay your taxes and stuff. They're like, no, it doesn't say that. Yes, it does, an awful lot. People get disturbed. But it also says that in the Old Testament. So basically, the idea here is, whether good or bad, if you make a vow to someone, you make a deal, you have to follow through with it. That's it. And we see consequences. So these kings make a deal. And so when they don't follow through with it, God doesn't like it either. And he's like, good, take them away. And bronze chains. And so we're in that cycle. So we saw Jehoiakim, and now we're in the midst of Jehoiachin, the next king there. He got taken away. Right? And so the last king, Zedekiah, Mataniah, his name, he is going to be there. Right? So he hasn't rebelled yet. So it gets very confusing. We've looked at the Bible, and so if you've been here for a while, you know this, but good to recap, right? So it's not in chronological order. They didn't write it and just say, whoop, it goes right through on a timeline. No, they're in sections. So just take the Old Testament, because that's what we're dealing with today. It's in sections. Torah, first five books, Genesis through Deuteronomy. History is next, Joshua through Esther. Then you have your poetry books. I'd put Job in there, right? All the way to Song of Songs or Song of Solomon. Then your prophets, Isaiah to Malachi. And if you want to put it in chronological order, you have to be crazy like me. And you have to sit there and kind of move them all around. Jeremiah. Jeremiah itself, we saw, is not in chronological order. So you have to take that book apart. And all of this is happening 
in the midst of like right in between like basically like two paragraphs <laughs> in 2 Kings 24 and 2 Chronicles 36. And so this crazy amount of stuff is going on. So we inserted Daniel in there the first three chapters. We did some of Jeremiah. Today we're going to find ourselves talking about Ezekiel. Now, here's what makes it even harder, and we can talk about this a little more. I'll quiz you at Bible study. The timeline in Jeremiah, although it jumps around, is actually a little easier because he tells you what king is reigning at that time. It seems like Ezekiel is, but he times everything by the king, Jehoiachin, that got taken away in exile with them. So remember the good figs and bad figs? The bad figs were the ones that didn't take the punishment. So it's kind of like if you're a parent, you're like, go to your room. And they're like, nope, I'm not going to do that. All right? So it's worse. It's going to get worse for you. And so these ones that don't go away, they're the bad figs. They're refusing to take the punishment they deserve in exile. Jehoiachin goes with them. So probably in Ezekiel's mind, he's thinking, this is the rightful king. And he's with us. This is the guy that takes the punishment with us. He goes with us. And, well, Nebuchadnezzar, he's installed this client king there. That's not the legit king. So probably what's happening here. But it makes it confusing because in the year of his captivity, in the year of his captivity, and it's like, where are we? So here's what I want to acknowledge today. I'm not doing it exactly chronological now. We'd have to go to Jeremiah, I think, for that. I'm kind of breaking from that because I want to stay on the train of thought of Jehoiachin, right? So we've learned about him. Let's keep learning about things that happen in his time. But it's basically the same time-ish, just so you know, because we do have people checking my work. So no, Lonnie, it's, <laughs> it's not exactly chronological. Um, but again, you have to kind of know when you have to be completely technical and not. And we're going to talk about that today, too. So let's just jump right in. Ezekiel 1.1. On July 31st of my 13th year, now that's confusing already, while I was with the Judean exiles beside the Kabar River in Babylon, the heavens were opened and I saw visions of God. This happened during the fifth year of King Jehoiachin's captivity. See how he's doing it? The Lord gave this message to Ezekiel, son of Buzzai, a priest beside the Kabar River in the land of the Babylonians, and he felt the hand of the Lord take hold of him. As I look, going back to Ezekiel's perspective, I saw a great storm coming from the north, driving before a huge cloud that flashed with lightning and shone with brilliant light. There was a fire inside the cloud, and in the middle of the fire glowed something like gleaming amber. From the center of the cloud came four living beings that looked human, except that each had four faces and four wings. Their legs were straight, and their feet had hooves like those of a calf and shone like burnished bronze. Under each of their four wings, I could see human hands. So each of the four beings had four faces and four wings. The wings of each living being touched the wings of the beings beside it. Each moved straight forward in any direction without turning around. That's weird. <laughs> right? So prophetic imagery. So I got an old picture here. So a lot of artists through the years have tried to like kind of show you what this might have looked like. Now, it's important to kind of pay attention to this stuff because it's a lot of symbolism. Did you notice the word like? It's like that. So here you have a prophet, a real one. He's seeing something that's incredible, right? You're seeing the glory of God, and it's heavenly, right? It's, this is not earthly, but he's going to try to make it like stuff that we have here. So you just, even though we have this, you have no idea what he might be seeing, right? So it's this heavenly thing, and he's just like, I don't know. It's kind of like that and that and that. But they're all symbols. So I, you know what? I'm not going to get too technical here. Basically, what you have here is the mobility suggests that God is everywhere of the wheels, right? He's everywhere. The Spirit is guiding it here. Um, the eyes, just that he can see everything. I was going to use really fancy terms. I'm not going to do it. An elevated uh, position, omnipotence, right? So it just means, you know, he, he's better than everything. Right? So you have these different things happening to suggest these characteristics of God. That's really what it is. Um, so basically, <clears throat> it's crazy. The man on the throne, it's like blue lapis lazuli. Now, if you play Minecraft, you know exactly what that is. <laughs> but anyway, and my daughter knew it. I was like, how would you know that? She's like, Minecraft, Dad, of course. You know? All right. But anyway, <laughs> where we learn things. So it's this crazy scene. 
And so, you know, he's hearing, it's loud, he's hearing all this stuff, and basically his reaction is, when he sees it, face down on the ground. He's literally floored, and then he hears someone's voice speaking to him. So if you turn the page, awkward chapter break here, it keeps going. 2, 1, stand up, son of man, said the voice, I want to speak with you. He's not going to have a choice. The spirit came into me as he spoke, and he set me on my feet. So now God is literally like controlling him. He's in control of him. I listened carefully to his words. No choice. Son of man, he said, I am sending you to the nation of Israel, a rebellious nation that has rebelled against me. They and their ancestors have been rebelling against me to this very day. They are a stubborn and hard-hearted people, but I am sending you to say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says, and whether they listen or they refuse to listen, for remember, they're rebels, at least they will know they have had a prophet among them. So as we continue on, he's telling them that again and again. You must tell them the message completely. It's on you to do that, but they're not going to listen. They're completely rebellious. Important note in verse 8. <laughs> tell them, or warn them, but do not join them in their rebellion. Don't become like them. And then he gives this illustration, yeah, but you're hard-hearted too. Like, like a, your forehead's like as hard as a diamond kind of thing. You know, you're, you're not listening either. So remember, in this context, controlling him. Then something weird happens, again, you might have noticed in the picture. Open your mouth and eat what I give you. <laughs> okay. And so what are you going to have me eat? A scroll comes out on both sides of it are like pronouncements of doom and judgments, funeral songs. Right? Great. I'm going to eat that. So 3-1, the voice said to me, Son of man, eat what I'm giving you. Eat this scroll. Then go and give its message to the people of Israel. So I opened my mouth, and he fed me this scroll. Fill your stomach with this, he said. And when I ate it, it tasted as sweet as honey in my mouth. So you know that song about like the honey on the lips? It's like almost a little awkward and uncomfortable when we sing it. Well, you, you kind of get an idea of what that comes from, right? So like honey in my mouth. So it, it's good for you, but here's the thing. It's this idea of digesting the word. And you're going to see as he talks more why, like what's going on here. So we've talked about it in the past in this church, right? You are what you eat. You are what you take in with your eyes and ears. So when you surround yourself with a bunch of garbage, we see what happens to people, right? They lose their minds. And when you surround yourself with the word of God, well, naturally, more good stuff is going to come out. That's the idea here. You got to put it in you first before you can go messaging to everybody else, all right? So this is what happens. Again, there are hard-hearted people. He says, listen, let my words seep deep, deep, deep into your heart. Those are cross words together all the time. But listen, again, listen carefully to them yourself. Do you remember that? There's a step before what we're going to talk about today. Do your homework. You listen carefully to them yourself. Again, do this whether they they listen or not. So here's what happens. Ezekiel gets taken away. The Spirit lifts him up. I'll make it short for you. Just brings him back to the Kabar River there. Total control of him. He is distressed. He's disappointed. He doesn't want to do this. Perhaps, like after eating a scroll, like that's not fun. But perhaps he knows what's going to happen to him. We're going to see in the future. It's not good. I've said this again. Prophets don't have great retirement plans. Right, so when people don't want to hear the message, they do horrible things to them. And he's also going to do some pretty crazy stuff. So he's back there. He's overwhelmed. He sits with them for seven days. So if we keep reading Ezekiel 3.16, after seven days, the Lord gave me a message. He said, Son of man, I have appointed you as a watchman for Israel. Whenever you receive a message from me, warn people immediately. If I warn the wicked, saying, you are under the penalty of death, But you fail to deliver the warning, they will die in their sins, and I will hold you responsible for their deaths. If you warn them and they refuse to repent and keep on singing, sinning, they will die in their sins, but you will have saved yourself because you obeyed me. If righteous people turn away from their righteous behavior and ignore the obstacles I put in their way, they will die. And if you do not warn them, they will die in their sins. None of their righteous acts will be remembered, and I will hold you responsible for their deaths. But if you warn righteous people not to sin, and they listen to you and do not sin, they will live, and you have saved yourself too. So here is an example of, and if you have different Bible types, of where you need to get a little more literal. So 
People ask me all the time, Pastor Gene, what translation of the Bible do you like? My wife knows the answer. All of them. <laughs> so that is in my house, all of them. I like to read from all of them. I want to see all of them. It's important. But what I've noticed in church is that many pastors are not necessarily great teachers because a great teacher is going to look out and go, all right, I've got a one-room schoolhouse here. This is K through 12. I got to teach everybody. Right? And so some of them go, all right, let me go to the most complicated version I can possibly find that even I don't understand. Yeah, that's a great way to teach people. You know, but it happens, right? They get prideful about their Bibles because you're so smart. And then Christians do it too, right? Because the pastor taught them how to do it. You know, the ESV is the best. The ESV is the best. It reads really choppily. <laughs> you know? it, it's not the best. What makes it the best? And here's kind of the funny thing that I'll share with you. I'll let you know a little pastor secret. When pastors get out of pastor school, for the most part, they don't really learn how to read Greek. It's not a thing. You don't do that. Ask any pastor. Like, oh, yeah, I know. And they say the Greek words up here, and they sound terrible. I don't know why they do it, because they can't read it. I did not learn how to read it. They don't. I talked to other pastor friends. And it's kind of funny. Think about it. And this bothered me. So what is the reason for holding the Bible? Like, when you come in here... What is the reason? What's the teaching? Why do you do that? Well, because we're taught you don't believe anything even a man says. You don't believe it, right? You want to read it for yourself. And I tell them all the time, if you're new, you know, I say, check my work. Check my work. And I do it at Bible study, right? Check my, you read it. And so I sit there and I do what I do from memory. But then they're all looking at it. You read it. And so that's the idea, right? So that's the culture where Christians have developed. Okay. So let's apply that logic. So the pastor's saying, this is the best translation of the Bible. But you can't read Greek. How do you know it's the best translation of a language you can't read? Well, the scholar told me. Wait a minute. <laughs> so is that the way you, it's not consistent logic. So I'm reading this because I'm not supposed to believe the scholars. Because they're wrong sometimes. But I'm going to believe them on the Greek. That's interesting. So this bothered me. Once I got ordained, I knew this. And then if you know me, <laughs> like that kind of thing bothers me. So I started to apply myself. I became a student of the Greek. I want to say, like, student, <laughs> student of the Greek. It's complicated. I don't know everything. There's no, I don't know modern Greek. Right? And the old, old Attic Greek is very difficult for me. Right? So, but I'm trying. I'm a student. My Greek teacher, Theodora, shows up once in a while. She corrects me at Bible study. She said last week at Bible study, I'm watching. You know, so <laughs> she really did. So you know, I'm watching you. You know, so, so, but I hold myself accountable in that. But I'm learning. Right? So here's the thing. I'll tell you what the conclusion I've come to. I can read a lot of New Testament texts. The Old Testament's harder. But this is going to be important. So I use the NLT. Because one-room schools. what if I have a five-year-old here right, and a Bible scholar? Well, how do you solve that problem? You just put the easy-to-read one up there, and you see me do it all the time. I make little notes. I say, eh, this is where I think it went a little that way, you know, but it's well-intentioned because they're trying to make it easy to understand. And that's exactly what happened here. So all of you should know that, look, this is the idea, right? If you warn them, you're good, right? If you don't, it's on you, right? So that, that's the idea, and I think the NLT did a really good job. But there is some imagery that we're missing. So I'm going to show you, in my opinion, the best translation of the Bible. It is the original. <laughs> that's the best translation right there. But it probably looks like a bunch of squiggly Lord of the Rings lines and stuff like that, right? So it's hard to understand. So I'm just going to kind of, I worked on this this week. So just to let you know, this is Old Testament Greek, really hard Greek. This is called Attic Greek. It's probably even older than that. Really old. So, so think about it. New Testament Greek, 2,000 years old. This, hundreds of years before that. So it's, it's crazy. So I went to my Greek teacher and we put some work on it. We did a translation together and came up with this. And so we just leave that there. That's what the apostles would have been looking at. That's kind of what they were seeing, probably even harder to read because it was written by hand in all capital letters, which is crazy, hard for me to read. But anyway, let's see if I can kind of just get through this. Now, again, again, like if I had this in front of me and I had to sight read it, no way. I can kind of hack through it and then I have to check my work. And so that's what I did during the week. So there's no way I would do this. 
But basically what it's saying is, <clears throat> and after the seven days, it came to be, and it's really interesting, to be born. So remember, we were talking about the genealogies. So it's interesting. To become, the word of the Lord came toward me, saying, son of man, and it's interesting here, it's actually, man is, is a different word. It's like Andras, or Andras is how you'd say it, or like a TH sound on the D. It sounds different. This is like uh, anthropology. Think about that, so anthropon. So it's like talking about mankind. So a little interesting. The purpose I gave to the house of Israel and hear a word from my mouth and warn them from me, for me and say to the lawless one. So it's like the word there is like A you put in front of it, like the anti-law one, nomos. Let him be put to death and I will not spare him. And you don't speak to the lawless man. Turn from your ways and let him live. That lawless man shall die in his iniquity. So we get like bigger words here, right? And I will require his blood from your hand. That's what it says. And hand and like, kind of like form are like the same kind of word there. That's why we get confused. And if you command the lawless one and do not, or remember the context, he does not turn away from his iniquity and his path, that lawless man shall die in his iniquity, and your soul will be saved. And when a righteous man turns away from his righteousness and commits a tra transgression, and I put suffering in his face, it says, he will die because, in the context, is you didn't warn him. I will not forgive him. And he will die in his sins because his righteousness, which he has wrought, will not be avenged. And the blood I seek this from your hand. But if you compel the righteous not to sin and he does not sin, the righteous shall live because I compel him and spare or rescue, like recite, save your own soul. Confused? Yeah, that's why you don't use the literal translation. It's harder to understand, right? So the NLT gave us a great idea, but we missed something. Right? I will require the blood from your hand. So it's very strong imagery here. So we would say in our language, probably adopted from this, the blood is not on my hands. So that, that's this, where this comes from probably, right? So you ever hear someone say that? Well, blood's not on my hands. And so that's what we missed from the easy-to-read text. Right? So I'm giving it to you, and I went the long way around. But it's a good exercise, right, to see what they were looking at. That's what it looked like. And it's interesting, right? So I care. I want to really know this stuff, and I think it's important. Before I go, this is the best translation. That's the best <laughs> translation. So anyway, the blood is not on my hands. Right? This is the idea. Or you'd say, the blood's on your hands. And so you hear, you have the context for this, Ezekiel, there you go. It'll come up again in Ezekiel 33 if you want to make a note and you're doing that. Um, so here's the thing. We, so here's the application for us. What does this mean to us? We are obligated as Christians to tell the truth in full. So step one, how do you tell the truth if you don't know it? So step one, put this inside yourself first, your homework. Step two, Tell the truth, even if it's difficult. So this will be like step one in our process today. As it is for Ezekiel, and as we saw last week, just because everybody else is doing it doesn't make it right. Make it right. We're obligated when we hear things that are wrong to tell the truth. And some people, oh, what's the big deal? It's just a verse or it's just that. Uh, you got to think about it correctly. If you read the Bible a lot, you know that God is really specific about his instructions, isn't he? And when you don't follow them exactly, really bad things happen to you, right? Think about this. We did this in the series. A lot of you probably know it, right? Strike the rock, God says to Moses, right? And the water comes out of the rock. They're complaining, right? So they're doing that all the time. So he does it, right? Then we get all the way in numbers and it happens a second time. What does he say? Speak to the rock, right? Strikes it two times. It's like, oh, second time, right? And yells at the people. God's like, Moses, you ain't going to see the promised land. That's it. Wow. So that's thing one. God doesn't change. That's thing one. It's very specific. Thing two, if we're thinking rightly, this is the word of God. All of it. All of it. And so when would it be okay? Let's just say your regular father. You take some instructions from him. And then you don't really like what he said, or you don't want to deliver it to someone else. Like, tell your sister, you know, whatever it is. <laughs> you know, I've been there. And, and so we're like, yeah, I don't really feel like giving this message in full. I'm going to leave some stuff out. Ooh, the blood is going to be on your hands when he finds out, right? So all of it's really important. And so when you 
twist it, when you take it out of context and make it about something else, right? Dad didn't say go on time out. He said take the car out, you know. No, that's bad. So what those people are doing, they're twisting God's words. There's punishment for that. It says a lot about false teachers in the Bible. No bueno. Not many of you should want to be teachers, friends, because we will be judged more harshly, James 3. So when they do that, it's bad. It's really, really bad. So just think about that. So we talked about this, remember? If it's mainstream, it's probably wrong. Do we understand that? If it's mainstream, it's probably wrong, and that applies to Christianity. And we've just seen that. Over and over, I tell these stories about the Bible, and it's amazing. Long-time Christians are like, it's, yeah, it's been right, like, tucked under your arm when you come into church and tell everybody you read it. <laughs> anyway, you know, so here it is. The prophets give warning, and likewise, we need to give warning, even if it's not popular. So what I want to do is I want to go through some New Testament examples. The best commentary that we have on the Old Testament is the New Testament, right? So it helps train. And people will argue and they'll use these big words, dispensational. Stop it. Stop it. Just read Hebrews. It clarifies. Read the Sermon on the Mount. You have seen, you have heard it said, you've seen it written, but I say to you, right, Jesus fulfills it. That's all, right? So we're not under the law of Moses. So you have to understand this. So you have to look to the New Testament. What are they saying about the Old Testament now that we have the fulfillment of it in Jesus Christ? Things change. So Choosing the 12 apostles. So here you have Jesus. He chooses the 12 apostles. Apostles just means like I send. Apostello means I send out. So they're the sent people, right? He's going to send them out, and he gives them some instructions. This time you're just going to go to the 12 tribes of Israel, not yet the Gentiles and the other people. But Matthew 10, 11, whenever you enter a city or village, search for a worthy person and stay in his home until you leave town. When you enter the home, give it your blessing. If it turns out to be a worthy home, let your blessing stand. If it is not, take back the blessing. If any household or town refuses to welcome you or listen to your message, shake its dust from your feet as you leave. I tell you the truth, the wicked cities of Sodom and Gomorrah will be better off than such a town on Judgment Day. Well, what's the idea here, right? Like, done. So, same type of idea here, like, Shake the dust from your feet. We do that a lot in Southwest Florida, right? <laughs> the sand. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but anyway, that's it. You've warned them. We're done. Now, we're going to put some, some more stuff on here. We see Paul does about the same type of thing in Acts. We look at the book of Acts. If you're familiar, there's a riot, Acts 19, in Ephesus. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians, right? So they're worshiping a false god. And what Paul's doing is he's convincing the people to get rid of that. And so they, they do away with, like, their idols, and it specifically talks about, like, their magic books, you know. So just whatever, spell books, they're burning them. Like, you know, tens of thousands, maybe millions of dollars of books. But here's the thing. You have these craftspeople, like Alexander the Coppersmith or Demetrius in this case. They're making these idols. There's little things, like little figurines of Artemis, and they're worshiping it. Like crazy, but anyway, they're doing that, but they're making a lot of money doing it. And so Paul is hurting their economy. And so they want to kill this guy, right? So Paul gets out of there, but he knows, right? He's going to go to Jerusalem. He's going to go to Rome. He's going to go away. So he wants to say goodbye to the elders in the church at Ephesus, but he's not going to go there. So he's going to Miletus, and he's going to give like this farewell speech to them. He doesn't want to be in danger. He's on a mission. He needs to go. And so basically what he's saying is, it gets a little complicated because he's like, I'm not sure what's going to happen, but the Holy Spirit tells me that I'm going to get imprisoned, right? I'm going to get persecuted when I go there. Right? So he's saying goodbye. I'm never going to see you guys again. But here's what he says, Acts 20, 25. Now I know that none of you among whom I have gone about preaching the kingdom will ever see me again. Therefore, I declare to you today that I'm innocent of the blood of any of you. For I've not hesitated to proclaim the whole will of God. Do you see it there? Paul probably has Ezekiel in mind. Because Paul was faithful he told the hard truth, he suffers for it, even if it means suffering, the blood was not on his hands. That's what he's saying. So let's keep going. So I want to kind of get some more application on this. Like, what's it going to mean to us? 
We get there by looking at the instructions he gives to his, like, protégés, the people under him. That's why these books are important. Why do we get, you know, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, Titus? This is interesting to see the instructions that Paul is passing to them. So they're like his, his el elders, his pastors, basically. Just think of it that way to make it really simple. And he's giving them all kinds of instructions. We've seen some of the stuff, remember? He told Timothy, right, in the latter times, this is where all the false teachers are going to be there. They're going to be more false than true, and they're going to prosper. So this is the backdrop. He's saying those, the ones that are prospering, yeah, that, those are the fake ones because that sells, right? <laughs> That's what we do here in America too, you know. So because it's mainstream and big, usually means it's wrong, right? So they've been selling a lot of people on stuff. So in the last time, there are going to be all these false teachers. They're terrible. So there's a lot about false teachers in the Bible. But here's the thing. 1 Timothy 4, 6, if you explain these things to the brothers and sisters, Timothy, you will be a worthy servant of Jesus Christ, one who is nourished by the message of faith and the good teaching you have followed. So the blood won't be on your hands. You're good. But look at this. Do not waste time arguing over godless ideas and old wives' tales. Instead, just train yourself to be godly. Don't waste your time. So now, if we keep reading 2 Timothy, so this is 2 Timothy 2.15. I had a mistake in my notes. But we have such good people who serve here, and they catch my mistakes. See, like no toilet paper on the shoes, no bad scripture verses. It's kind of cool. 2 Timothy 2.15. Work hard so you can present yourself to God and receive his approval. Be a good worker, one who does not need to be ashamed, and who correctly explains the word of truth. Avoid worthless, foolish talk that only leads to more godless behavior. If we keep reading, Paul repeats himself. Again, I say, don't get involved with foolish, ignorant arguments that only start fights. A servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but must be kind to everyone, be able to teach, and patient with difficult people. I know. I'm working on it, right? Okay, so we get to, <laughs> we get to Titus. Same situation, kind of. So Timothy is left in Ephesus. We were just talking about Ephesus. He's there. Titus, Crete. I hear it's really nice there. So he's left there, and he's left there, Paul says, to appoint elders in every town. So that's what he's doing. He's appointing. This is the proper process. You get anointed. You have the anointing. You get appointed, right? We confirm it. It's from God, not like the congregation <laughs> voting. So Titus goes in there. He knows the qualifications. Paul gives him all the qualifications for elders, overseers, that kind of thing. Goes through the list, and he starts saying some very important things, okay? You have good behavior, Titus. Tell your people to have good. He goes through all these different people groups, like the old women, the old men, the young men, the young women. He says something interesting, that you can slander the gospel. And if you don't behave well, it says blaspheme the gospel in Greek. You can slander the gospel with your behavior. Look at me. I'm a Christian. And then, you know, you do something really bad. That's not good. They say, I don't want to be a Christian. So that's what he's going through. And here's what he says. Interesting. Titus 3.9. Don't get involved in foolish discussions about spiritual pedigrees or in quarrels and fights about obedience to Jewish laws. These things are useless and a waste of time. So see how it clarifies here? Right? If you were in the Old Testament, you'd be arguing about it. Not now. If people are causing divisions among you, give a first and second warning. After that, have nothing more to do with them. For people like that have turned away from the truth and their own sins condemn them. Have nothing to do with them. The blood is not on your hands. You have warned them. That's it. Just don't get involved. Look, their own sins condemn them. What's he talking about? We talked about this in the series, right? If the person has joy, peace, love, patience, kindness, self-control, gentleness, all these are all godly things, right? But if a person's divisive, and it says this, read Galatians 5, divisive, outbursts of anger, always argumentative, that's not from God. You don't want to waste your time talking to Satan, right? Like, no good. And it's very harsh. It's hard for people to hear. When people are acting like that all the time, that's not God. That's not God inside that person talking. Godly people, don't, they don't have those qualities. That's it. So what does he say? Have nothing to do with them. Blood's not on your hands, Titus. So here we have a situation. I'll go through this pretty quickly, and I want to get to some just real practical application for you guys as you go out. We looked at 1 Corinthians 5. I told you the situation. It's a situation I try to bring up a lot because it gives us a good example. What we're confused about as Christians is, is like, wait, who do we judge? 
You know what I mean? What's going on? This just really gives us a nice, clear example. It's a little gross. The guy's in the church sleeping with his stepmother. I told you about how that could be happening. Did I do that right, stepmother? I'm bad at the family tree thingies. But anyway, gross. I told you how it could be happening. He's been told. Paul says, I wrote to you in a letter before, so we know there's a correspondence. We don't have. Paul says, I'm there with you in spirit. We've warned this guy, so they went through the process. Now that's it. Kick him out. And he gives this example, like one lump of leaven. And if you don't know what leaven is, it's confusing. So I would say, like, one bad apple can spoil the whole bunch. And he's saying, you're prideful by letting this happen because you think it's not going to spoil you is the context. Interesting. But he says this, 1 Corinthians 5, 9. When I wrote to you before, I told you not to associate with people who indulge in sexual sin. But I wasn't talking about unbelievers who indulge in sexual sin or are greedy or cheap people or worship idols. You would have to leave the world to avoid people like that. They don't know any better. So don't, don't start there. <laughs> it's not where you start. You start with love. You start by loving them. Okay? You have sin to it. Anyone comes to my office, what do I do about you know, these people, you know, this group of people, or that group of people? I'm going to get a mirror. <laughs> right? So what do you, you want to point out their sin publicly. That's what you're telling me, right? Because we have to. I'm Ezekiel. Really, we're going to see what Ezekiel does, and we're going to see if you still want to be like him, right? But I want to just do this. Mirror. Because that's what Jesus does when people complain to him about stuff, remember? Let's start with your pile of sin first. Just because it's not so outward and obvious, right? Plus, Paul's saying here, they're not Christians. They don't know any of that. They don't know the rules. That's it. Like, just God will judge them. Like, just, that's it. But here's the thing. I meant that you are not to associate with anyone who claims to be a believer, yet indulges in sexual sin, or is greedy, or worships idols, or is abusive, or a drunkard, or cheats people. So you want to stick on like specific sins, right? There's a lot more of them. Some people you should be checking off boxes, right? Don't even eat with such people. So let's concentrate on that verse, right, before we go applying it to people who just don't even know the rules. They don't understand any of what I'm saying right now. It's not where I'm going to start. So here's the other thing, too. Paul's worried about also, you know, even if the problem with people who claim to be believers and do that, you can be guilty by association. Even if you're not going to fall for that sin, well, people are going to lump you in with that group. So you don't want any of it. So it's just the practical advice. So we've seen in this series, what do we do? What do we do with this? What, what are the steps? Okay, we've seen in this series that we must always love and we must always forgive. There's no but after that, okay? No but. <laughs> no but. Always love, always forgive. Now here is the but, but not on having to do that. Sometimes it can and sometimes it has to be from afar. Proximity, right? Sometimes it has to be from over there. It needs to be afar, from afar. We need to warn, right? Then the blood is not on our hands. But if they're going to cause us to sin, if we're going to be guilty by association, whatever the situation is, we're going to turn into a bad apple, lovingly do that. That's it. I've loved them. I've done my job. So the question today is, we're answering it, when is it okay to walk away? When is it okay to do that? Practical steps. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to build off of what Paul probably has in mind. Jesus teaches, Matthew 18. It's kind of like the situation is a little different, but it gives us a good kind of like simple step guideline. Right? So if someone sins against you, you go up to them first, one-on-one. One-on-one. Right? One -on -one and you just, So think. Everyone's got to stay with me. Do not gossip. Don't, I love this one. I'm just going to talk about this person for accountability first. No, you're not. You have the Lord for that. Go to the Lord or go to someone who's going to keep it confidential or perhaps pull a mirror out of their desk. So come talk to me, right, because I know how to keep my mouth shut about your stuff. Right? And that would be real accountability. And I'm probably still going to tell you, go, you got to talk to God. I'm not God. So that's the first thing. Go directly to that individual and talk it out. Why? The ultimate thing is reconciliation. And if you don't want that, check your heart. Right? If we're Christians, we should desire that everyone is reconciled to Christ. 
That's what we want. And, and with us, too. So I want to work this out, man. Like, you know, like, let's solve the problem. Step one. Step two, they don't listen to you. Bring some people in for accountability. There you go. I could be wrong. Bring them in. You need a mediator, right? Something like that. And so we know this even in a court of law. They do that kind of thing. Bring somebody else in if you can't work it out. Great. Three, tell it to the church. That's probably not so-and-so is doing this and that. You know, it's probably not that. It's probably more like go to your leadership, right, and talk to them about it, right? Try to get the church leaders to solve it. Then if they don't listen, like three strikes, you're out. Then kick them out of the church. Treat them like a sinner or tax collector. And so this is the thing here. So now, when is it okay to walk away? When you've warned them. When you've warned them. I told you. There you go. So whether the context is preaching the gospel, you know, you've warned them. I told you the good news about Jesus. That's it. And if you're not going to listen, well, whatever. Paul says, don't argue about it. I'm not going to argue about it. And we get people in the church with these little secondary things and these Christian easy stuff, and, and they want to argue about it. I'm like, no, I don't want to argue about it. You can go believe that if you want. Let's not fight. Why do you want to fight? So, again, what's in the heart of that person when they always want to argue? Enough. I hate arguing, right? No, that's not love, joy, peace, patience. Kind of just, look, I, I have enough of that in the world. Don't bring it into church, right? So we've warned them. So whether it's a sin against us, whether it's the gospel context, whether whatever it is, you know, whatever, right? You've warned them. Blood's not on your hands. When they cause divisions, that's more on my end. That's like what I got to watch. It's like the worst part of the job. It's like I got to watch people who are going to come in and divide, just start causing division. So what they're doing is they're bringing all this junk from the world, right? And they're like, what are you, a red sheep or a blue sheep? You know, you got to be a red sheep if you're a Christian. And they're like, Gah! You know what I mean? Like, stop it. That belongs. You should be coming here for love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, self-control. Like, you should be coming here like, please. You know what I mean? Like, give me the message of joy. Correction? Yeah. Right? By trying to make it funny. So anyway, that you should be coming here to be a part of a family filled with joy. And when you get a person who comes in, it's like, rah, 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 you know, it's like, no. Leave that there. Not even at the door. Just keep it away from the parking lot. Like, I don't want it anywhere near the church. That's garbage. The world is garbage. <laughs> this, we're talking about the kingdom. We are citizens of the kingdom of heaven, people. Like, that's what we want to be focusing on. Not this, like, keep that away. So that's when it's okay to walk away, right? I've warned you. Don't do that. Stop it. Don't bring that here. And then it's okay. I'm like, blood's not on my hands. But you don't let them do it here. Here's another thing that a lot of people don't think about. And it may, I do this a lot in pastoral work, so I'll kind of share something with you. And I've been talking to a lot of other pastors about it. And really, as I deal with people and I learn about people and, and, and typically what they do, um, you want to refine your process. Or it's insanity, right? It's doing the same thing. So I watched the last two pastors burn out from this church. I'm not doing that. You know what I mean? So I'm going to do things a little bit differently, right? I'm going to make some adjustments if I'm thinking, right? So this process applies, and this may apply to you. Like, Pastor, why are you telling me about Because you can use this. You can use this because it's probably happening to a lot of you. And it's this idea like time. I can't, as I get older, it becomes the most valuable thing to me. A younger gene would have said, like, my love languages, physical touch, and words of affirmation. Those are probably mine. Now that I'm older, I don't care. <laughs> like, physical touch, yes. But, okay, we won't go there. But here's the thing. I care more about quality time. Quality time. I don't have much left. Quality time. You can't buy time, right? You can get plenty of money. It's everywhere, right? You can't buy time. You just, that's it. It's gone, 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 gone. I look back and I'm like, whoa, my daughter's driving. You know, like, how did that happen? You know, I get and look in the mirror. What? You know what I mean? Like, that's not good. You know, like, <laughs> do something about that. Right? So, so you know, what, what's happening? Time. Time. And so here's the thing. And you might have this happening to you and you don't know it. People are wasting your time. They're wasting your time. I get kind of upset about this now. I hate having my time wasted. And so apply the process. Talk to them. So to anything. I, I dealt with the case this week. So fine. You know, help me pay for this pastor. Do that. Blah, blah, blah. Okay. You know, I know I'm being lied to. Everything. Whatever. But mercy. So if it's giving someone something, you want to know how to do this? Mercy. 
The first step is always love and mercy. So I don't care. I'm not asking questions. You didn't even give me a story. Here's the money. There you go. Whatever, right? But, two, they come back. <laughs> and they have a different story or it didn't work out or whatever it is. All right. Well, let's go back and remind them about step one again. Let's go back to step one. What did I tell you? What did you tell me, right? Third time, <laughs> I'm done. I'm done. What? Think about, like, people in your life, situations. Has it ever changed? Like, you've talked about for years with certain people, and maybe you have a person in your mind that just didn't change. When do you think it is going to change? When? What's the date? You know, like, when is the, what? Now, here's what I've learned. This is, this is what I've learned. I talked to pastor friends about, like, older ones are like, I wish I had just applied this years ago. Look, first time you come in, identify, love, mercy, going to give you all the tools you need. That's fine. We're great. Whatever it is that you need, whether it's a problem, a sin, this, that, the other thing. And here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pray for you. And those of you who know me well, a lot of you sitting here today, you know I pray for you. I contact y'all. <laughs> like, I pray. And so I'm going to do it. Right? I might not be doing it in the office at the time, whatever. I pray. And I'm going to pray that, and this is an interesting prayer, not that, oh, you go and prosper in your sin. No, I'm going to pray that you hit like the highest bottom possible so that you need to surrender to God. That's it. And I'm going to pray that you receive his Holy Spirit because that, that is the person who is going to best be able to convince you. I'm not God. I have never convinced anyone to come out of their sin or whatever. You know, I preach, I tell you what you're going to do. No, the Holy Spirit does that. When I see people change, it's because God does it. I'm just the messenger, and I got to go like this. Okay, fine, Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit doesn't do it. It's going to come in a second time. <laughs> you got to go back to step one. Like that, why do you think there's a different step? But here's what we do. We keep giving people alternatives. No, no. And after three times, listen, man, you know what I mean? Maybe there's another church for you. There's not, I don't, whatever it is, like I can't do it. But I'm done over and over and over and over. So I'm giving this to you. You can learn like a pastoral trick. <laughs> like exactly not. Just allow yourself to do that. Allow yourself, check the boxes in your head. Have I given this person loving, loving, sufficient warning? Loving, sufficient warning. Did I remind the person the next time it came up? So I tried two or three times. Maybe give a third time. But after that, the blood's not on your hands. Let it go. Right? So, so I'm preaching some freedom today. I just feel like this is going on in a lot of people's lives. Let it go. You're not God over this situation. Just let him do what he does best. So the other thing, too, as we close, just a good point here. Don't let the person derail you into sin. That's big. Remember I said that? One bad apple. One bad apple by association. So when can you walk away? When you're starting to act like that person. You find yourself getting angry or they're baiting you into this. Proverbs 22, 24. Don't befriend angry people or associate with hot-tempered people or you will learn to be like them and endanger your soul. Did you know you could do that? I'm not saying, this is God's word. But I said, don't. Don't befriend the angry people. Don't associate with them. It rubs off. Be really careful. Don't let them bait you. Back to Ezekiel real quick as we close up. Ezekiel 2.8, son of man, listen to what I say to you. Don't join them in their rebellion. Don't join them. If it's going to make you do that, it's okay to walk away. So as we go out this week, we are assigned to be heralds for Christ. Watchmen on the wall. Right? To the disturbed, perhaps, we're watchmen. But for our own sake, the sake of our family, our church, we must not spin our wheels and become like them. So in the convincing sometimes, when we think we're helping, really, it's just self-idolatry. <laughs> you're not God. You think you're helping. You think you're helping. They're pulling you under the water with them. Careful. And I care about you. I love you. I don't need to see any more people lost to the world. So just please hear me. We must retain our citizenship in heaven. 
and be ambassadors for Christ. As I close, I want to pray from the word from Colossians over you. I ask God to give you complete knowledge of his will and to give you spiritual wisdom and understanding. Then the way you live will always honor and please the Lord, and your lives will produce every kind of good fruit. All the while, you will grow as you learn to know God better and better. I also pray that you will be strengthened with all his glorious power so you will have the endurance and patience you need. May you be filled with joy, always thanking the Father. He has enabled you to share in the inheritance that belongs to his people who live in the light. For he has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son, Jesus Christ, who purchased our freedom and forgave our sins. All glory to God the Father forever and ever. Amen. Amen.